Welcome everyone to our monthly open forum. Glad to see so many people walked over here with the wind chill below zero. As I told Dean Jones that uh, as we walked over here 20 feet apart on the sidewalk, that uh, you don't necessarily pay attention to who's near you on the sidewalk when you're just putting your head down and trying to get to the next destination with a door. So thank you for making the effort to come today. Uh, we have several topics for today's forum, starting with uh, the legislative session that's ahead and moving into some of the pieces uh, of that and then also talking about some uh, updates on campus uh, news items that have transpired since the last time we were together. So if I might start with the legislature. First of all, it convened yesterday uh, as required by law. The Constitution asks the governor in December to present his budget and then the governor starts the legislative session with the state of the state address. So the legislature will meet up to 40 days according to the Constitution. And what we know based on the governor's budget address is that revenues are a little soft again. The sales tax projections are, are uh, under where appropriators and where the uh, administration thought those projections would be. That was the governor's message yesterday. In his budget address, he has proposed a 1% market increase for state employees. He proposed uh, about $413,000 of ongoing funds for the South Dakota Opportunity Scholarship, which does affect many of our students. And he also uh, put forth uh, $919,000 for the continuation of the Board of Regents Maintenance and Repair Initiative that started actually during the tail end of the Rounds Administration and then uh, sat off to the side for a while because of so the soft economy during the recession. So those things are probably what stuck out from the budget address initially as far as higher ed was concerned. So last year, for those of you who paid attention to the legislative session, there was an awful lot of talk about the sales tax increase and teacher pay for the K-12 system. This year, interestingly enough, we'll have some other topics that aren't necessarily focused on higher ed, such as initiated measure 22, the uh, uh, measure that was voted by the in November that was labeled as campaign or as a finance reform, election reform. Uh, we'll also have uh, the governor said yesterday he wants to talk to legislators about selling some state property and repurposing those those lands for other uses and also doing something then with the revenue from those sales. And uh, I expect that, uh, as he hinted, we'll have some new looks at known topics. Some other, uh, some other topics probably from previous years will come up. I would like to, before I hand this off to Stacy Cruzmark, highlight uh, Madison DSU hosts the Legislature Day. Three weeks from now will be a busy week for people connected to this university. So on Monday, January 30th, there will be an alumni reception in Pier that coincides obviously with, with the start of that week in the session. Uh, Tuesday, January 31st is Madison DSU hosts the Legislature Day. Uh, some of you participated in that in the past. We'll have a similar format this year, including a reception at the Ramcota, meeting with legis meetings with legislators, a meeting with the governor, and uh, uh, some time for committee hearings. The 31st also starts the two days of hearings for the Board of Regents in front of the Joint Committee on Appropriations. So for those of you who have followed that in the past, that is the, will be the morning of the 31st and the morning of the 1st. Uh, President Griffiths gets to lead the Dakota State contingent on the second day of the hearings. Uh, the regions get that whole four hour block on both days. And then lastly, uh, research day at the Capitol will be on January, or on February 2nd rather, and President Griffiths will be giving a presentation then. So if you think about that, three weeks from now will be a busy time for Dakota State and Pierre. So with that as a backdrop for the legislative session and for this forum, uh, I, in the rare spot of leadoff hitter, I'm going to hand it off to Stacy. Any questions for Bob before he leaves? I wasn't giving that option. Oh, I was definitely given that option. A um, couple more items. You want to slide back? Yeah. All right. As Bob mentioned, the uh, Board of Regents will be presenting to the State Appropriations Committee, Joint Appropriations Committee on January 31st first 
and February 1st. The uh, board will actually lead off that presentation. Uh, President Randy Schaefer, Executive Director uh, Mike Rush will likely present an overview of the system. And then each campus will have their opportunity to present uh, information about their local issues and in-campus issues. Uh, we are scheduled last institution on day two, so which is always an interesting thing when we start thinking about the time. Uh, so we hopefully will have all of our time. We've been promised our full time, and, and that is one benefit. So we uh, will have the opportunity to present that second day, uh, and we'll have a a great opportunity to share our story about Dakota State. Um, just to note, we do have three local legislators that you're probably well aware of. Uh, Representative Matt Woolman has been appointed to the Appropriations Committee. Uh, that's a pretty daunting task as that committee meets every day pretty much from 7.30 a.m. to noon and then they go to their full house and Senate chambers in the afternoon. So it's a it's a big task. Our other representatives, uh, Representative Leslie Heineman has been assigned to Health and Human Services and State Affairs, uh, some two pretty important committees there. S Senator Jordan Youngberg, who's our uh, new legislator to this district, uh, has been assigned to Ag and Natural Resources and Local Government uh, is his other committee. So just for your information. Something that I'm sure all of you have heard in the governor's budget address when he presented in December was the 1% salary policy proposal. I do say proposal. Um, the legislature has to approve something at the conclusion of their uh, 35 or 40 day session. The governor needs to sign that piece. But right now the proposal is a 1%. So I'm sure many of you have questions. Well, how is that going to impact me either as a faculty member, as a CSA employee, or as an NFE employee? And if Angie's here, she said she would give all the details on how that would be. You don't see her here. Well, lucky her, she's not here. So I'll have to answer those questions. Um, you know, all kidding aside, we will be monitoring that very closely and try and get that information to you. I know that's something that everybody is anxious to know. Uh, really, we have more questions than we have answers. You know, as we think about faculty, that distribution is dictated by COHE. Normally, it's a three to four percent pool, and that formula is then allocated. How does that work when it's one percent? Um, I don't have the answer to that right now. NFE has a similar process. Um, I don't have the answer to that quite yet either. CSA, a little more information. You've all completed as employee your ACES form um, and that process, hopefully. You're supposed to have that done earlier, I think, this month. Your managers are completing their portion of that and will be conducting those meetings. The intent was that that process would be the performance pay mechanism, and the governor has proposed that we not do the performance pay for CSA for this upcoming fiscal year, but we are continuing through that evaluation process. So putting my optimistic hat on, I think it'll be a good process to go through. We'll learn how this works, and then in subsequent years, uh, we can improve that process, but then build upon that to actually have that performance pay within there. So again, ask any of those questions to Angie and uh, she'll be happy to answer those for you. Uh, that leads us into the next section, which is search updates. Oh, sure. Um, a note went out on um, on uh, what we might call lobbying activities, and I just want to be very clear how it works. If you are asked or you're, you're addressing a representative on one of these topics and you're representing yourself, could you please make it clear that you're representing yourself and not the institution? If you are asked to represent the institution, then I ask that you let us know that you've been asked to represent the institution in any kind of statements, panels, Etc. So that we're all clear. But you, you know, you're welcome to talk to legislators at any time. But the Board of Regents ask that if if you're just putting your opinion in, you make it clear that it's your opinion and not necessarily the official opinion of DSU or the Board of Regents. It's okay. Does anyone have a question about that? Okay, great. Thanks. Actually, I hand this off to uh, Dave. Are you up next? Okay, um, just talk a little bit about the provost search process and where we're at right now. Um, so last week, the search committee, the provost search committee met in Sioux Falls for two very long days with six candidates for the provost and vice president for academic affairs position. Um, 
After that, we came to the conclusion that we wanted to bring three, at least three on campus. And you can see here on the screen, those are uh, Dr. Bradley Skelter from Delaware State University, uh, Dr. Timothy Crowley from uh, Fort Hayes State University in Kansas, and Dr. Joe King from Auburn University in Montgomery. So uh, right now we're looking at three candidates and potentially a fourth candidate that uh, we're not identifying just yet as we're working through some logistics with him. And uh, we'll know more about that later, uh, later today or this week. And so with all these candidates, we'll be sending out some information later this week about each of the candidates. Uh, but we do want to invite you. They're all going to come next week. So it's going to be a long week next week. We want to get through this process quickly and make sure that we don't uh, lose any candidates and so we're moving quickly and uh, we're going to bring them here next week. Uh, there'll be an open forum uh, from noon to one on these days listed here that we encourage all of you to come and um, uh, see these candidates and hear from them. They'll be given a, a 40, 35, 40 minute presentation to the group and then uh, potentially 15, 20 minutes of questions at the end of that uh, open forum. So that's next week. Uh, we're pretty excited about the, the committee is very excited about the candidates and all the candidates are very excited about coming to DSU. Uh, they certainly have done their homework and uh, they know a lot about DSU and I know they want to know more. And so uh, it's going to be a long week next week, but we're looking forward to it. And uh, uh, they're very strong candidates and uh, very interested in, in DSU and uh, very interested in Dr. Griffith's vision for the university. And so uh, they certainly have done their homework and uh, we hope to hear more from them next week. So uh, long week and we do encourage you to uh, uh, participate when you can, so. Preparation for this long week, I'm going to give you a, a holiday on Monday. <laughs> okay, great, I'll take it. Any questions on the provost search? Great. I will turn it over to Dr. Ben Jones now to talk about the dean search for the. Uh, good afternoon. We we are uh, not as far along. In fact, I don't have a fancy slide to share with you. But uh, we are by design a few weeks behind the provost search. Uh, the the candidate that are vying for the Dean of Business uh, position. Uh, the pool is uh, what I would call an impressive pool, a solid pool of candidates, so we're very hopeful. The committee right now is kind of combing through all the records, and uh, we hope to have the uh, people on campus to interview in mid-February or so, and with the announcement at mid-March to late March. So that's kind of our timeline. Good afternoon. Uh, the, the committee that is on the search for uh, College of, of Computing Dean has been meeting and discussing. We do have a pool of candidates, a very small pool of candidates, and we're in the process now of going through the records and getting ready to um, do some phone interviews and reference checks and so on. Our timeline as we go forward is that um, later on in March, we are going to be having on-campus interviews. Right now, we're set for the week of March 20th. And by design, we are also a little bit behind the provost search. So hopefully, the candidate who is hired for that position um, can have a little bit of input on this position. So that's where we're at with that. Um, it feels like kind of a slow process because we started back in September. Uh, we've been working hard and I thank the committee. Some of them are here today with us and some are not. But it is, it, anybody that serves on a search committee knows that it does take a lot of time and effort. Not just the meetings, but you have to go through a lot of information and try to make really good decisions. So the committee is trying to do that and I commend them for that. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer. Never. Okay, thank you. Okay, my trouble. Oh. All right, the last section we have to update you on today is facility projects, which seem to be a continuing theme on our on, on our forums. But I'll just do an intro for Jeff here in the December board meeting. 
the uh, Board of Regents approved a preliminary facility statement for an athletic events center. And I'll let Jeff talk more about our planning for that and our athletic master plan. Okay, a 1% increase in money, what to do with it, what to do with it. Oh, got an idea. All right, for some of you who have been around here as long as Judy, uh, you know, since the university started, uh, you will have noticed that nothing's really changed much up at the field house. Just as a quick background on it, uh, when we built the field house back in 1957, uh, we had uh, 407 students on campus and we had 70 student athletes. This year we have 253 student athletes. Uh, next year our goal is to have 350 student athletes and in about five years we plan on doubling that. So there obviously is a need for some growth there based on just uh, the initial numbers where we started and where we need to go. Um, we have some, again, some growth ideas for us for our individual sports of adding JV programs and enhancing a lot of our programs on campus. For instance, um, you know, we get IT students. That's not a problem for us to get IT students. But sometimes, uh, if you look at our numbers in athletics, a lot of our student athletes are not IT majors. They are business majors. They are education majors. They are biology. They are exercise science majors. And so these are going to, uh, these additional 250 students will be enhancing those programs for the most part, as well as enhancing our enrollment numbers and our university. Um, we will also be looking at adding some new sports. Obviously, soccer is one that uh, uh, pretty much every school has, has put in. All of the private schools have it in. And we will be giving an option for a uh, public school price for a student athlete who wants to play some soccer versus having to go someplace and paying thirty-two to thirty-five to 50000 if you're over in, in Minnesota in their Division three programs. So, uh, there's some growth there. There's some interesting programs that are growing up all over the nation right now. Bowling, it's hard to believe, is the number one growth sport in the NEI right now. Um, <clears throat> so anybody who has a bowling background might be interested in some coaching. We might have an option there for you as well. Um, uh, bringing golf in, uh, a sport that we had in the past, bringing it back. And I just read uh, in the last three days where Mount Marty is adding archery, men's and women's archery. And considering how many bow hunters we have in the area, that's probably not a bad idea. So those would be some areas as well. As we look at our master plan for growth of our of our university, growth of our athletic department, and uh, and then as we start looking at facilities, obviously a 58 year old building. You know, one of the things that when I went to Hastings, a big part of my decision to go there was I went and saw their facility. They had a brand, not a brand new, it was built in 2002, but it was a $22 million athletic complex. And you drove up to there, and every student athlete, prospective student athlete we had drove up, and as soon as they hit that parking lot and saw the columns and saw the uh, brick stadium and then walked into the building and they were ceiling level looking down on the floor, there was a wow factor where they go, I don't know how, but we got to figure out how, to, how we can pay for this $32,000 a year education because I want to play ball here. Now, we have athletes come into our place and they drive up and they look at the brick building outside that was built in 1958 and looks like an elementary school built at that time. And there's a wow factor there, there as well. And they go, wow, is this where you play? My high school gym's bigger than this. And so that's really, as we get into the recruiting wars and the, and, and the battle to become better, we've made some great steps with our scholarship programs. Uh, as many of you are aware, we raised uh, three quarters of a million dollars a couple of years ago to enhance our scholarship programs and make us competitive when we walk into a family's home to say, we can, offer, we can match that offer that uh, Morningside's offering, that Dakota Westland's offering, that Mount Marty's offering. We can match that or we can maybe even do better. But what we can't match is the facilities that they're coming into. And that's a big deal with, with uh, uh, people. Uh, they want to come into something bigger than what they play. And so that, that pool where we used to be able to recruit class A and class B and 3A and 2A and 1A over in Minnesota, 
Um, those schools now have, have better facilities than we do. Madison's built a new building, Harrisburg, T, Lee, just go down the list of all the Class A schools, and those kids are coming in and, and not being impressed by what we have. And so in that recruiting war and in that master plan, we've got to take the next step up. Um, again, if you look at the history of the GPAC, of those of you who are sports-minded, uh, Hastings built their facility in 2002, and then since then, Doan, Midland, Dakota West, or, or um, uh, Nebraska Wesleyan, Concordia, Northwestern, every one of the schools have built new facilities because it's, it's an arms race for students. And so we've got to move in that direction. So, like I said, with that 1% raise that you're about to get and you just don't know what to do with it, uh, I've, got some, I've got some thoughts if you'd like to come up and, and see them. Okay, looking forward to uh, working with the architects. Our coaches are very excited about that that part of it and and uh, so soon hopefully well right now uh, if you're not aware Jamestown is leaving and they have decided to go down to the GPAC um, their president is an interesting individual um, pardon <laughs> well I like ours a lot better than I like theirs. Let me phrase it that way. Uh, no, his, 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 he's about to retire. And his goal was to get them out of the heathen public school conference that they were in and get into a faith-based conference. And they've been working. This is their fourth application. They finally got accepted. Um, I have a feeling that once they get a new president and that new president takes a look at the budget and how it's tripled just being a member of the GPAC, that in a very short order, they'll be quietly negotiating to get back into the North Star. That's my prediction. Um, along with that, we've been talking with Grace University down in Omaha. Uh, they have been bought, and there's some, there's some things going on there. There's some, there's some pluses, there's some minuses. There's a brand new university in Omaha now, Hope University. We just got information on, uh, they started contacting us about playing ball games. And so there's a potential new member in the conference, which would then put us over the 10, which gives us the two automatic qualifiers instead of the one. Um, and, and so as far as in our conference, there's some growth coming. We were just not sure, but again, if you've kept track of any sports right now, Conferences are about as fluid as you can possibly be. The Big Big 12's got 10 teams in it. The Big 8's got 10 teams, and you know, uh, from Division One on down. Every time, frankly, every time there's a new president, there's a new philosophy comes in, and that philosophy may change your alignment, may change where you're at and what you're doing. So um, I, I think the safest thing is we can continue to grow as fast as we can with the idea that now we have some flexibility if somebody decides to leave or somebody decides to um, discontinue sports, who knows what happens as, uh, as five years pass. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. There's uh, two potential new members in the league um, to take place of Jamestown. Questions for Jeff? More? That's it? All right, thank you, Jeff. I mean, I'd, I've been here over 10 years and it's pretty exciting to see uh, some movement in athletics and, and some of the things we can do there. The field house and your birth date, pretty close together? Too much older? You looked good, Jeff. <laughs> um, I mentioned that the preliminary facility statement, and this is the bureaucracy that we have to shepherd these projects through at the Board of Regents level, that preliminary facility statement was approved for the Athletic uh, Events Center at the December meeting. In October, if I'm remembering my dates correctly, the board approved the Mad Labs or Mad, uh, Madison Cyber Labs project, that preliminary facility statement. Um, we had a request that was uh, supported by the Board of Regents to uh, make a request to the state to fund that facility. Unfortunately, the governor had not supported that in his budget presentation. We're continuing to, to move forward on that. I know uh, Dr. Griffiths has a lot of exciting things that we're, we're still doing there. We just selected an architect for that project last Friday. Uh, that architect has partnered with an engineering firm that has a lot of expertise and experience uh, with uh, the type of secure and other types of facilities that uh, we're looking at within that building. Uh, and the architect that we selected has a lot of familiarity with higher ed uh, in the region, but also a lot of other 
uh, good quality projects. So we're really excited to get started with them. The name of those architects will be out here shortly as soon as we get contracts in place uh, for that. But I wanted to mention the process a little bit as we think about the athletic uh, event center and then this building, we have three steps that we have to go through and get Board of Regents approval, which might think, okay, that's going to be the building meets, meets here, and then two months or three months later, and then another one. Uh, at, at sometimes it goes much faster, sometimes it takes a longer process. Uh, I have seen the board approve two of those steps in one meeting, which is interesting. Um, and sometimes it takes a little bit a little bit longer. So we'll continue to move through that process. Um, we'll continue to keep you guys informed of, of what those steps are. But as we begin the planning, those affected parties will be integral in, in providing input on you know, what, what is really needed in an athletic event center, not only for our programs that we have today, but, and thought about bowling or archery, but, but those future programs and how do we make sure that we meet those future growth needs. So I'm gonna shift gears and let Marcus talk about the Trojan Center and the Learning Engagement Center new residence hall or former hospital. I think we're just gonna keep calling it the former hospital. I like that. Um, so a couple things, just want to get you uh, caught up on some of the progress on those two facilities. Um, let's start with the Trojan Center since that's the one that you see most of the time you walk through or you walk by and you can uh, obviously see a lot of disruption and uh, because we're currently used, still using the facility, obviously uh, there's a lot of moving parts as, that, uh, as we go through this process. Um, let's start with the new kitchen area, which is the new uh, building or the, the new construction on the north side of the building. Um, unfortunately, that was scheduled to be open uh, when our students came back this week. Uh, we'd really hoped we would be, uh, Sodexo would be cooking out of the kitchen, we'd be serving out of the new servery area. And unfortunately, we're, we're a few weeks behind. I would guesstimate about three to four weeks behind. But again, um, a lot of times that's a moving target. Um, not, not really anything to be that concerned about as far as the overall progress of the building and then what that delay does to the rest of the facility. I think we'll be okay there. I, I think what the bigger hang up will be is now Sodexo will have some logistical challenges uh, here in the next few weeks as we transition from that new old kitchen to the new one. Uh, what we were hoping is that that move would all happen over the holiday break, the semester break, uh, where they would have had two weeks for, you know, testing the new equipment, getting the old, uh, not the old, but some of the uh, equipment that is going to be moved over, moved over during that time, because we that's really going to be about, a, we thought, a two to three, three day process. And now that's going to have to happen while we're in session. And um, as you know, Sodexo works, cooks seven days a week and serves out of that uh, kitchen seven days a week. So there's not really going to be any downtime. And so things are going to happen at odd hours. We may be doing some moving overnight, uh, different things like that. We're, we're kind of looking at, at all of our options right now. But that's kind of where the, the bigger headache will come from um, in this delay. But um, we are, we're really excited. We've been in there and seen the progress. They're getting the new kitchen equipment installed, um, getting the new uh, cabinetry into the servery area, and it is looking really good and uh, just waiting for that finish. And we are hoping that uh, when it does open, we'll have a little mini grand opening because uh, it's kind of exciting. This will be, you know, if you look at the three big projects that are happening on campus right now, when that kitchen and serving area are completed, that will be kind of the first sign of, of, of a finished product and, and the first piece of, of uh, you know, that's usable to our students and, and our faculty and staff. So we're really excited about that so we'll there'll be more uh, information coming out on that I mentioned that, uh, you know, again, we're not really concerned about the overall timeline of the project. Um, just because we're stalled out a little bit in the kitchen area, uh, we're still moving forward. Uh, if you've been by the old uh, student services area, which is, you know, just south of Einstein's uh, right now. Uh, if you've been there this week, you've looked in and seen it's just a big open hole. Um, they didn't, uh, Journey and their crew didn't take long to get in there and start uh, uh, demolition, and they've gone to work on that. And so progress is still con continuing in other areas of the building. So that's good news. I'm um, really excited about that. Uh, if you are looking for student services, so like the Residence Life Office, card services, student activities, they are now downstairs in the underground where student success used to be.
before they moved over to the library. Um, so if you're looking for them, they're downstairs in, in the old student success area. Um, Sodexo, if you're looking for them, they are still upstairs. Uh, we're hoping to be uh, finished with their offices here really soon. So uh, hopefully they don't have to make two moves. We're hoping we can just get them moved one time. So that is what's happening um, on that side of the building. Now progressing over to the west side of the building, you'll notice that the Southwest edition is still in progress and they're moving along just fine with that. Uh, that's gonna be the new, I guess, living room or lounge area for the students. So that's uh, progressing. I was just talking to Corey this morning. I think roofing will be, they'll roof that in the next week or two, probably. So that's exciting, progress happening there. Um, the bookstore, that's kind of our next logistical challenge that we're going to be facing uh, because the crews need to get into the bookstore and uh, start to do some demolition work in there and then some reconstruction. So what we're looking at, we want to get through the rush of the start of the semester. So probably the, I'm guessing the last week in January and then that first week into February, um, the bookstore will be moving. Uh, they'll be vacating that space and going over to Kennedy Center in room 120. Um, they're going to just, I, I got to thank Crystal and the College of Ed. They've just taken us. We're just, uh, we, we just keep infiltrating Kennedy Center. Um, our new coordinator of diversity, Mark Edwards, uh, has an office in, in, in Kennedy Center right now until we get some other uh, room for him. And now the bookstore is going to move over that way. And uh, they've been great hosts and we appreciate that. So uh, the bookstore is going to try, is going to, is going to work out of Kennedy Center in that center core area. And uh, it'll look a little wonky, but uh, we'll make it work the best we can, um, you know, for the next uh, six to seven months until uh, their new area is ready in, in the Trojan Center. And then we'll move them back again. Um, so I think that is pretty much all for Trojan Center. Any questions on that? All right, very good. Just ask that you continue to be patient with us. We know um, a lot of uh, moving and shuffling. We've had a temporary wall up in the marketplace area. That is back down now, so more space in the marketplace area. So that is good news. Um, so let's go across the street then to the uh, Learning Engagement Center and Residence Hall. And uh, that's kind of that for me, that's really an exciting building progress uh, project because, you know, everybody can kind of see the beacon going up, which is really cool. Everybody who walks by or walks in the Trojan Center can see what's happening. But, you know, with the with the old hospital, once the clinic came down, you know, it's really hard to see what's happening in there. And so uh, every couple of weeks when I get a chance to walk through, you can you can see it just uh, taking shape and taking form. And it's really cool. Um, you know, the first probably three or four months was all demolition and just tearing the inside apart. And you probably saw the crew walking out about every five minutes with materials that were going to the dump and now we've transitioned and shifted gears and now we're rebuilding back in which is which is really neat um, exciting stuff um, upstairs right now um, all the framing is happening, so that's gonna be the new residence hall. So you're starting to see the rooms take shape, take form, and uh, now they're coming behind with the drywall, which is, uh, again, you're just starting to see things move along and, and see how they're gonna look uh, towards the end of the project. Um, so that's really kind of exciting on that. The Learning Engagement Center down below, um, again, a lot of demolition. Haven't uh, Some of the walls have remained, um, but for the most part, really haven't started building back there yet. But uh, that'll be, uh, again, coming in the, in the near future. Um, Canfields, just put a little uh, plug out. Uh, Canfields, who out of Sioux Falls, who we're working with on furniture, they will be here next Tuesday. We don't know exactly the logistics of that day or the schedule of that day, but they're going to have some furniture available, uh, both office furniture and um, you know student lounge furniture, that type of thing, uh, for people to come in and test out, test fit, and see uh, what students like, what faculty and staff like, what they don't like, and and uh, just give some feedback. And like I said, I don't know exactly what that day is going to look like yet, how it's going to be scheduled, but uh, uh, you know I know we've got some of our students here, um, staff who are either going to reside in one of the new areas or if you just want to kind of come and see what's happening uh, because you know when you start to see that furniture uh, when you start talking furniture you're really starting to uh, notice that things are going to start coming to completion so we'll get more out on that but uh, feel free on Tuesday at some point to come on by and see what's going on and just check out the furniture and give us some feedback on what you like and don't like so unless anybody has any questions I think that's all I have all right. Thank you. 
right, thank you, Marcus. Um, if you haven't, let's see if I can pull this up quickly. If you haven't visited the website recently, underneath the uh, construction tab, there are additional photos and would thank Jane and, and Barb for getting this information out there on the uh, bottom left here. There's a, a gallery of, of photos that you can see, some of which were a period of time ago when we were just taking up the parking lot for the Beacon Building, um, constructing the Beacon Building, but also interior seeing. I think there's a neat one here with the, well, this is the clinic coming down. Um, here's the inside demolition of the of the former hospital, which again is very interesting to look at now as we've reconstructed several of those, several of those areas. Um, so again, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at those and we'll continue to post more information out there um, for all three projects. And if you have questions, please let us know about um, how things happen. So the Beacom building is still on schedule or on track there. We've been pouring the actual floors within there. It was kind of an interesting, neat day to see that happen on a colder day and see this little fog come up from the, from the concrete that's being poured. Um, one thing, as we've talked about in the past, and the reality is is now hitting us, um, this domino effect. And I can remember being up here a couple of years ago talking about, we'll build this building, and then that will be this huge domino that clicks a number of different things. And uh, Dr. Griffiths is going to talk a little bit about what that process is as we determine what exactly goes into the Beacon Building, and then subsequently, what goes after that. don't have the answers. Um, Thank you. Um, first of all, I should say welcome back and Happy New Year to everyone. It's good to see you all here. Um, I, it's going to be a busy semester and time is going to fly by, I'm sure, long weeks included. Um, as we move towards, uh, we're already planning the opening event for the Beacon Institute, but we also have to determine who exactly is going to go in there, into these buildings and where. We know a little bit about the Learning Engagement Center, but everything else is a little vague and we need to put some... Uh, uh, some detail to that structure. So in addition, so we'll start with the existing, with the new buildings, who's going to move in, we'll have to have a process, we'll have to have some discussions around that. Um, but it then raises the interesting question, the, the space vacated by people who are currently sitting somewhere into these new buildings creates uh, vacancies in, around the campus. And I think it's going to be um, uh, worthwhile for us to take a little time to think through space allocations uh, for the institution as we're going forward. There may be some, some, um, there may be a more rational way to allocate some of those spaces. I'm not saying everybody's going to shift and move and we'll play musical chairs, but I do think we owe it to ourselves to take a good solid look at available spaces at adjacencies, at who works with whom, who has needs, who's growing as we look forward at our, our projections for the future. So that's a process, the domino effect is going to start running fairly soon because um, we need to know by by the by, by next August, um, what's going to happen? Some of the some of the spaces that will be vacated will need some upgrades. You know, maybe paint and other things. Some may create other opportunities. I I haven't looked at it yet. I just know that this is coming, and this is the semester when we're going to have to be looking at it. So it's going to be busy. We've got you know the searches hopefully coming to co conclusion. We've got three facilities that we have to open, and we're planning openings. Um, the Beacom Institution formal opening will be in August. It will be sometime during the uh, um, the, welcome, the weekend that everybody comes back, so just to let you know that. We uh, had thought about when the regents come, but it's, uh, we can't wait till then. When the regents come, they'll meet in October in the Beacom Institute building. We'll give them tours of all our new facilities, and then, as Jeff says, let's take them on up to the field house. So we'll probably end, uh, have a nice reception there in the field house, and uh, have them feel our pain, or feel Jeff's pain as we go forward. Um, we, uh, uh, the Beacom Institute building, um, we're having some conversations with Premier, people at Premier, 
about that opening. So as soon as we have some more details, we'll, we'll let you know. And I know that some people have been volunteered and have volunteered for a committee. I haven't got around to it yet. We will get around to convening those committees to talk about what we do. We know we're going to want to have some kind of soft opening for community members. I'm sure people who used to work in the hospital would love to come and see what we've done with that building. So before the students are in there, we're going to want to have some tours for the, uh, the broader community. Um, but it's an exciting time. And I have to tell you, you know, there are presidents who do nothing but build buildings. Um, James Mieser, who was the chancellor at the University of Nebraska, built a lot of buildings at the University of Nebraska, all grand buildings. And then he came to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and we entered the largest building phase ever in the history of the university. And I think we, we doubled the size of, of the institute. And um, when I was coming here, I was thinking, you know, that's not the kind of president I'm going to be. I'm focused on other things. And here it is, we come in, we have three buildings sort of about to start, now they've started. Now we're talking about the Mad Labs building, we're talking about athletics complex, um, we're talking about future needs and residence halls and downtown Madison and all sorts of things. So it's not me, it's, your, it's you. You've created this environment and these opportunities. I'm just along for the ride, but uh, I just, it's just very interesting that all of these facilities projects are coming up right now. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? As I say, I don't have answers, but we'll want to consult and have some uh, uh, sort of open forums and discussions about space with uh, the various groups that occupy it that might see other spaces. So I've told Stacy. Nobody has dibs on any space yet until we've really done a sort of comprehensive review of, of space. Um, the other thing I thought before we finish it would be good, I was thinking about next month and what should we talk about next month. We probably have an update on the legislative session. It occurred to me that it might be good to do, uh, to focus the forum on Mad Labs. Um, and we could sort of talk about plans for Mad Labs and how that's evolving and people who've got sort of directing various of the labs within the Mad Labs. That might be a good topic for a forum to get everybody onto the same page to know what is it we're designing this building for and give you some of the detail and opportunities that exist within that space. So unless somebody has a better idea, that's my suggestion for a focal point for uh, February's forum. Concluding statement? No concluding statement? Okay. Any questions on any topic? What's going on? Yes. Um, we haven't, well, there, there is some, well, only as it relates to specific academic programs in Beacom. So, um, so not your ge generic students uh, uh, project space like that in Beacom, no. Um, Beacom is predominantly a classroom, teaching lab, collaboration space. Um, there have been some conversations about some of the spaces over by the um, hospital, the old hospital, the former hospital, um, but we haven't really I don't, I'm not aware we've gone more specific than that. Okay. I think in, yeah. Um, thinking about that domino effect, the next big question, and we've actually have several dollars in our HEF funds, our higher ed facility fund, earmarked for East Hall renovation. As you probably know, there's HVAC units that are size of a tank in a room uh, that need to be replaced, windows. We've held off on doing so until we know what the floor plan of that building would be. Um, kick me if I'm wrong, Corey, but thinking about the, the third floor, the top floor in East Hall, um, actually there, there are no um, supporting walls in the interior there, so that the ability to change that top floor is really, I mean, it could be one giant room um, or we could portion that off. What do we want to do with that is really that next step as we move and transition to our new buildings. What does East Hall then become when we move some of those classrooms to that new facility? And, and how do we go about doing so? And we have some dollars earmarked to do that renovation. So including room eight in the lower level. 
but I don't know what it would be. <laughs> questions okay well then i thank you and uh look forward to seeing you next month and don't forget you've got a holiday on monday thank you <laughs>